invite you to open a Bible to the book of Acts chapter 14. Over these summer months, we're going to be going through the second half of Acts, learning from God's word through the life of the Apostle Paul, what it means to believe in Jesus as a disciple, but also what it means and looks like for a church and for individuals to share the gospel of Jesus wherever we go. And so as we prepare our hearts and minds to hear from God's word in Acts chapter 14 this morning, I invite you to join me in prayer. Our first prayer is for our own hearts and minds that the Holy Spirit would open them to God's word and the gospel of Jesus Christ this morning. Our second prayer is for our brothers and sisters in Christ that the Holy Spirit would comfort them through the gospel and message of Jesus and that they would be encouraged and lifted up in their faith. And finally, I ask that you pray for me that I would preach faithfully the word of God and boldly proclaim the gospel of Jesus this morning. Psalm 19 says, may the words of my mouth and meditation of my heart be acceptable and pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. So Acts chapter 14, we're going to look at this story beginning in verse 8, and it's a unique story in the book of Acts. And so book of Acts begins with this massive bang called Pentecost, where the Holy Spirit shows up in a massive and powerful and miraculous way, empowers the apostles to proclaim the gospel in a multitude of languages. And what you see from there is people going back home, taking the gospel of Jesus with them. And in the middle of this is this reminder that Jesus has told the disciples, we talked about this last week, and he told you and me, whoever believes in him, that our job as Christians is to go and bring the gospel to make disciples of all nations. And he tells them, I want you to start in Jerusalem, then I want you to go to Judea, then Samaria, and then to all the ends of the earth. And then in response to the miracle of Pentecost, right? Anybody ever hoped for or prayed for a miracle of any kind? You're just like, God, I need to, right? That's a good thing. The Bible tells us to do that. I just wonder if that miracle happened, right, in, in just a supernatural, powerful way, what your reaction would be. I think we'd like to think I would, I would run out into the world and be like John the Baptist or Elijah or some hero of the faith where it's like, look at all the amazing things God has done. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to boldly tell everybody, right? That's what I like to think about myself anyway. I'm not saying I would do it, but you know, you want to be optimistic, right? Well, in response to Pentecost and the massive miracle that is the Holy Spirit pouring out on the apostles, you know what their reaction to the Great Commission is? They do nothing. They don't go anywhere. They just stay in Jerusalem. Now, in their defense, I guess you could say the first place Jesus said to start was Jerusalem, but he also told them to do what? You got to leave the city. You got to leave your comfort zone and, and go out to the surrounding areas. And they refused to do it for a few chapters. And then eventually God gets their attention and they start going out and sharing the gospel but what you'll see if you read the book of Acts is there's a pattern that all the apostles follow, including the apostle Paul, which is when they go to places, one of the things that they do is they find people who already believe the Bible. They go into the synagogues, they find um, Jews who believe in the Bible, they also find Gentiles, you'll see them called God-fearers in your New Testament, that also believe in what we call the Old Testament of the Bible, and they go to them and they begin proclaiming the gospel to them. And we saw this last week in Acts chapter 13 where Paul goes to people that already have knowledge of the Bible, right? They, they know the Old Testament. They know the promises of God. And what he proclaims to them is Jesus is the fulfillment of those promises, right? And that's what we believe as Christians. Jesus is the fulfillment of those promises. He is the one who's come to bring forgiveness of sins. 
But in Acts chapter 14, in this story this morning, there's something very different about it. This is the first time one of the apostles goes to Gentile pagans. They they go to people that are polytheistic in nature, that they believe in multiple gods, they don't know the Bible at all, they have no church background, they don't know anything that the Old Testament says, right? You see this later on as Paul goes to more and more pagan cities, they don't understand what he's talking about when he talks about Jesus rising from dead and those kinds of things. So here's the question. We talk about sharing the gospel, right? And we are called as Christians to share the gospel. There's three things that you need to do as a Christian, right, for all you note takers. One is to know the gospel. Know what, the, what it actually is, know the story. Know what the Bible says is the gospel. The life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. Second thing, this is what makes you a Christian. You actually have to believe the gospel. Because I have friends that I grew up with that can quote the Bible better than most of you and they do not believe in Jesus. They know all the facts, they know what it says, but they don't believe it. So the second thing is you actually have to believe that Jesus lived, died, and rose again for the forgiveness of your sins. Most of us, how many of us are okay with those two things? Show of hands, like you're comfortable with that. You're like, yeah, I can, how many of you could check those off your list this week already? Like, already done it, I'm a good Christian, right? So. Any wild guesses on what the third thing's gonna be based on the last two weeks? <laughs> you have to go in, share the gospel so that more people will know and believe in Jesus. And that sounds good, and we get a little nervous though, right? Sometimes we act like the apostles. They're like, yeah, I know it, and I believe it. I don't wanna really wanna leave Jerusalem. I don't want to go to somewhere. I definitely don't wanna go to the ends of the earth. How many of you really want your entire life uprooted right now, just instantly? Right? Yeah, most of us are not like, whew, let's just do it, right? So we sometimes act like the apostles. We're like, yes, this Holy Spirit, and yes, we talked about this last week, that God wants to use all of his believers for the Great Commission. And last week, what we saw is this story of the apostle Paul going to people that already knew the Bible. So they they knew the promises, they knew the prophecies, they knew all the themes and the foreshadowing of Christ. But now in Acts chapter 14, he's encountering people that don't know the Bible. And just so you are aware, there is a lot of people in our country and in your neighborhoods and in our city that don't know the Bible. But guess what they still need? To hear about Jesus. So what we do today is we look at the stories, learn how do we share the gospel? How do we proclaim the goodness of Jesus to people who they don't know the Bible? This uh, two times really shocked me. So when you go to seminary, they fill you with knowledge. Now, if whether or not you retain it all is a different story because it's kind of like drinking from a fire hydrant. They fill you with all kinds of knowledge. And you leave thinking, I've got all the knowledge. I got everything I need to convince you to believe in Jesus. And then you get into the real world and you realize it doesn't always work that way. Right, so one time when I was on Vicarage, which is your third year seminary, you do an internship as a pastor, I was leading a new members class, and it ended up being me and one guy. And it took about six weeks to do. We met three hours each time. This is a really intense new members class because he didn't know anything about the Bible, right? And this was my seminary brain just going like, oh, everybody kind of knows where, you know, basic knowledge or whatever. And I told him, all right, we're gonna start in the Gospel of Matthew. (laughs) He raised his hand, which is funny because there's only two of us in the room. I was like, you don't have to raise your hand. All right, (laughs) there's no one else in the class. It's just me and you. And he goes, where's Matthew? Right? And in my middle of seminary brain, I was like, I don't know what to do. (laughs) They 
they didn't prepare me for that, right? Because I was like, well, no, you're supposed to like have a basic, like you've, you're at least semi-familiar with it, right? The other time this happened, uh, my wife and I were leading a small group in our uh, one-bedroom apartment in Washington, D.C., and, you know, there's only 700 square feet for, like, eight of us. It was, like, sardines in there already. It was just like, hey, everybody get to know everybody because this is all the space we have, okay? And he's now my best friend in the whole world, but when we were beginning this group, he didn't know, and he started bringing his then-girlfriend, now his wife, to the group, and they didn't know, and so I'd be leading a Bible class, a discussion, and I would reference something. Be like, oh, you know, like that story with Abraham. How many of you have heard of Abraham? Everybody in the room, except for my wife, (laughs) raised their hand and went, who's that guy and what's that story? And so we had to pause and go all the way back, and I had to show them where Genesis is, right? Just so you know, some people don't know where Genesis is in the Bible. Now, here's my point with all this. We live in a culture, in a world, where there are people who who don't have a church background, they don't have the Bible background, they don't have the common stories that you are so familiar with, and yet, guess what Jesus is calling us to do as his disciples? to still go to them and bring the good news of Jesus. So in Acts chapter 14, starting with verse 8, now at Lystra there was a man sitting who could not use his feet. He was crippled from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul speaking, and Paul, looking intently at him and seeing that he had faith to be made well, said in a loud voice, stand up right on your feet. And he sprang up and began Walking. Now, I don't know about you, but anytime I was growing up and I would read these miracle stories in the Bible, I always wished one thing was that they would happen in my life. I was like, well, that'd be pretty neat, right, to do that. And then eventually it went from thinking, well, that would be really neat if it could happen, to thinking, well, that doesn't really matter for my life. Because how many of you are walking around? performing healing miracles on a daily basis. Anybody? Right? So what started creeping into my mind was reading stories like this and just thinking, well, that's really neat, but what am I supposed to do with that? Right? Anybody ever thought that? You're just like, that great it happened. Of course, Paul could do it because he's the apostle Paul, right? And then I would just sit there going, all right, Lord, well, on Tuesday morning, what do you want me to do? Just walk around till I find somebody and heal them, do you, right? Or awkwardly try? Anybody, as much as we get nervous about sharing the gospel, how many of you want to walk out these doors right now, walk up to strangers and try to heal them? And Paul said it with a loud voice. How many of you want to do that? Yeah, no, no hands. Now you're all thinking, be cool if I could, but I think it'll just be really weird and awkward. So what do we do with this? Because here's one of the things, we get distracted by the miracle, we just go, oh, well, that's just Paul. But here's the thing. It's Paul's preaching, along with the miracle, that causes the big commotion that we read in the scripture reading, right? Starting in verse 11, when the crowd saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. And that's the whole trigger for them wanting to worship Barnabas and Paul is what? Paul's miracle. So here's the first thing of what we can learn from Barnabas and Paul in terms of going out into the world and sharing the goodness of Jesus with people that don't know the Bible, don't have a church background. And the first thing is this, to to love the needy. Love, Love people that are in need. Jesus says, I came to be a servant of all, right? He washes the disciples' feet. He says, I want you to do like this for others. I want you to serve other people. I want you to show kindness to the poor and those who are marginalized and in need. Now, that doesn't mean you're gonna be able to solve all the world's problems. You're not gonna be able to figure it all out. But one idea that I heard from a preacher a long time ago that really stuck with me was this idea of do for one what you can't do for all. 
You're not gonna be able to solve all the brokenness of the world and all of its sins. It's not your job. But you, you can do for one person an act of kindness, an act of service, an act of love when they are in a time of need. Right? Paul doesn't heal everybody in the city, does he? he? Just heals one guy. And so one of the things that we can learn in terms of how do we bring the goodness of Jesus into the world, how do people see it as part of our lives, that Jesus really is good, he really does care for all people, and one of those things we learn from Paul and Barnabas here is to love the needy, to help those that are in our path that need kindness and need service and need love. First John 3, verse 18 even tells us not to just love with our words, but to love in both deed and words, to love in both action and in truth. The second thing that we wanna do, it gets progressively harder, just so you, my list is getting, gonna get harder for you, okay? So the first thing is love the needy. How many of you are interested in the church and Christians should take care of people and help people in need? Show of hands, right, great. I wanna ask you to raise your hands again on the second point. <laughs> the second thing to do is to identify the idols in the culture. Because this is what happens. Verse 11, the crowds come, they celebrate Barnabas and Paul as Zeus and Hermes. They want to worship them. And then Paul and Barnabas speak back to the crowds to try to prevent them from doing this. In verse 14, but when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore their garments and rushed out into the crowd, crying out, Men, why are you doing these things? We also are men of like nature with you, and we bring you good news, we bring you the gospel, that you should turn from these vain things to a living God, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. In past generations, he allowed all the nations to walk in their own ways, yet he did not leave himself without witness, for he did good by giving you rains from the heavens and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. So one of the things that Paul is doing here is he's identifying the idols. Now, for them in Lystra, it's very obviously Zeus and Hermes and a bunch of other Greco-Roman gods that even have a temple dedicated to Zeus there. That's why the priest of Zeus comes rushing out of like, we're gonna throw a really big party. Now, how many of you, if I handed you a megaphone, I don't have one, so don't get too scared, and told you, I want you to go out into the streets and just walk up and down Rainbow and start yelling at people they need to repent of all their idols. Would anybody come up to me and be like, can I get an extra megaphone? <laughs> right? Most of us don't want to do that, right? Now, here's the deal. Will we think of identifying the idols and by the way, everybody, Christian and non-Christian, has idolatry in our hearts, and we'll get into that in a moment. When we talk about that, though, I think most of us have in our minds a picture of someone like Paul preaching out in the marketplace, preaching out in the amphitheaters, and just letting the truth of the word of God out into the world, no matter the consequences. Or we think of people like John the Baptist, right? Great hero of the faith, but how many of you wanna be like John the Baptist, being a fiery preacher yelling at people to repent? And so we kinda of shy away from it, right? Because we don't wanna be like that. But here's the other thing. I think we struggle with telling people idols or, or realizing the idols in our culture and in people's lives because we don't want to hurt feelings. We don't wanna upset people, we don't wanna disrupt the relationship or anything like that. But there is a way to go about pointing out idols that is done in a kind way, right? Romans says it's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. Not the fiery brimstone wrath of God, but it's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. So Paul and Barnabas, they point out the idols and he says, here's what you're missing with your idols though. They're not fulfilling you, right? And he says they're vain things, and then he says, I want you to turn to the living God. So he's telling them, look, you are worshipers. 
You are worshiping these things. You're worshiping Zeus and Hermes or anything else that you think comes from them, but they're just statues. They're not living. They don't actually give you life. They're vain and empty. And Paul's point is it leaves you unsatisfied and unfulfilled. And so he says, but what I'm inviting you to do is turn to the living God who actually fulfills your heart, who gives you the rains and the harvest, who gives you the things that you need in life. Here's the reality. Whether people believe in Jesus or not, the Bible says everybody is a worshiper. We are all worshiping someone or something. What that means is we are all seeking fulfillment for our hearts and souls. We're all seeking fulfillment in our life, the thing that, that'll make me feel alive, right? We often say, we hear people say that, I, I just want to feel alive. I want to be filled with in my soul and in my heart. And what we do is we chase after all kinds of idols to do that. We change after all kinds of things, whether it's our job, it's employment type, it's a status, it's a relationship, it's family, it's money, it's all whatever you want to put into that bucket. And here's the reality that everybody can agree with whether you want to admit it or not. It all leaves you feeling empty, which is why you have to buy new stuff. Right? This is why impulse buying at stores works. Anybody ever fallen in that trap? You're like, that looks neat. And then you get home, you're like, uh, what am I going to do with this? But in the moment, what did you tell yourself? This will make me what? Happy, joyful. It'll, it'll fill me, right? right? We even have in our, our culture, in our world, we have things that are called planned obsolescence. Right? It's super annoying, and it's a whole other conversation. <laughs> but what that means is companies build things intentionally to die on you and not be able to be fixed. By the way, this is how cell phones are made, right? And the point is what? It will wear out, it'll die, it will not be as new and shiny and as amazing for me, so I will have to do what? Go get more. I have, and this is what Paul is getting at me. He's saying, why are you going after all these things? They're vain, they're empty, they don't actually satisfy your heart. And so what we have to do is we have to recognize that there's idols all around us. And the invitation of repentance is not to turn away and so you can avoid fire and brimstone, it's to actually enter into a full life. Because Jesus said, in one of his promises, he said, I can that you would have life and have abundant life, a fulfilled life. And so when we identify idols, we're not uh, being mean, we're not trying to tear people down, we're not trying to wreck them or anything like that. What we're doing is actually loving them and saying, you are a worshiper. You're, you're searching for things that will fulfill your heart and soul and make you feel alive. But you're searching for it in all the vain things and you need to find it in the living God who meets those needs. St. Augustine, his probably most famous quote says, Oh, Lord, our hearts are restless until they find rest in you. Now, many Christians I've met have heard this phrase from Augustine, that our hearts are not at rest until they find rest in God. What most Christians don't know is where it comes from. It comes from a book that he wrote called Confessions, where what he does is he does an autobiographical study of his life. And if you don't know, Augustine hated Christianity for most of his life, which is ironic. Now we call him a saint, <laughs> He spent most of his life hating Christianity, hating the God of his parents. His mom tried to drag him to church all the time. She was a Christian, and he rebelled against it, and he hated it. And he went and spent all of his money living like the prodigal son. Um, he spent it on women and prostitutes, and all these kinds of things, all kinds of wild living. And then one day, he went to church or to an outdoor worship service in order to make fun of the preacher and to cause a mob like what Paul went through. And St. Ambrose was the guy preaching, and Augustine ended up getting converted on the spot. <laughs> so he went to church going, I'm gonna make fun of this like nobody else has ever made fun of this. And then he left as a Christian. But the full quote, he said, Augustine is this, you have made us for yourself, O Lord. And he's saying, that's why our hearts are not at rest, until they find rest in God is because we were made 
for God. We are made to worship, and the problem isn't that we are, whether or not we are worshipers or not. Our problem is, are we worshiping the God who gives us life, who fulfills us? So the first thing we need to do is to love the needy, to meet the needs of the people that we can. The second is to identify idols and invite people to leave behind their vain worship for worship of the living God. Now, I said this progressively gets harder. Here's the third one. You have to endure the hardship. I think this is one of the biggest reasons we don't share the gospel as Christians, especially in today's uh, cultural environment. How many of you enjoy being insulted or criticized? You just wake up, you're like, boy, I hope there's an angry email this morning. <laughs> right? Uh, right? How many of you go to work going, I hope I got in trouble again this week so I can have more frustration? Anybody? Right? We have this innate desire to be liked by other people, right? How many of you would rather be liked and well thought of than criticized? Most of us would, right? Some of us would be like, I'd just rather not be thought of at all, just be completely isolated, right? That's the whole thing, but <laughs> we're gonna have to endure the hardship. So here's what happens. Paul preaches the gospel. He loves the needy. He, can, he invites them to leave behind their idols to follow Jesus. And then in verse 19, but Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him outside of the city, supposing he was dead. That's a little bit harsher than a mean email or a rude text message, right? Right, a lot of times we're like, I don't wanna do the hardship, which is maybe they won't like me as much or maybe they'll talk to me less or to make things awkward. And those are all possibilities. And so we read this story and it's like, well, Paul's amazing. He does a miracle, he proclaims the gospel, people are converted and the result of that ministry is he gets hit with rocks and stones until he's so bloodied and beaten they think he is dead. And so they drag him outside the city. Now here's one of my favorite Bible verses of all time. But in verse 20, but when the disciples gathered about him, he rose up and entered the city. And on the next day, he went on with Barnabas to Derbe. Just... <laughs> They drag him outside because he's so bloodied and beat up, they think he's dead. And he wakes up the next morning and walks into the city of Lystra and goes, and another thing. That's impressive, right? Like, anybody ever worked out or tried to work out, and then you woke up the next day and you felt so sore, you're like, I'm never doing that again, right? Paul wakes up and he's like, he has a, you know Paul has a choice here, right? He could just go on to Derby. He could just go on to the next city, but he doesn't say that. What does he do? He got up and went where? Back into the city to do what? Obviously, to keep sharing the gospel. This is a reality of the Christian life. Jesus says, they persecute me, so don't be surprised when they persecute you. The apostle Paul, when he writes to Timothy, he says, everybody that desires to live a godly, Christ-like life will suffer persecution. Look, not everybody in the world is gonna rejoice over the fact that you follow Jesus. Not everybody in the world is going to rejoice over the fact that you share the gospel message with them. But remember what I said when we wanna also love the needy is do for one what you can't do for all. You might not convert everybody. Not everybody will be receptive to the gospel. Just like in the life of Paul, some people heard Paul preach and you know what they did? They got baptized and helped start churches. Other people heard Paul preach and you know what they did? They hit him with rocks and stones until they thought he was dead and dumped him out in the city, outside the city walls. One of the things you and I will have to come to grips with as followers of Jesus in this life is that if we want to take the gospel to the ends of the earth or to the people in our lives who don't know Christ, we will have to endure the hardship. But we do so in the spirit of Paul and the other apostles who endured all kinds of hardships because, like we talked about last week, we know the reason we're sharing the gospel is not to check something off a list, but because we love people and so does Jesus. 
And we don't want to just meet the physical needs of those in need. We also need to meet their spiritual needs. We need to meet the spiritual needs of people that are stuck worshiping vain idols, things that don't fulfill them, by sharing the gospel so they can invite it to trust in Jesus, the living God, who gives them life and life abundantly. This leads to the last thing that we want to do. It's not the least important, but it's the last one on the list. We want to meet the longing of people's hearts, okay? We're all created for God, as St. Augustine says. The Bible talks about how we are designed and created to worship him. And we all want, whether people believe in Jesus or not, we all want the goodness of the gospel. And here's my evidence for it. I really like Star Wars and Lord of the Rings. Anybody else? Anybody else a nerd like me? All right. It's okay. We won't be shy anymore. (laughs) Here's the point of those stories and other stories like it. Right? If you just share the story of the gospel, people will look at you funny. I've shared this story with you before. Typically, my uh, pattern on airplanes, and my wife knows this, is I sit by the window because it's the furthest away from all other human beings. And I can just put my headphones in, look out the window, pretend to fall asleep, and not have to have that awkward, so where are you going? What you want to do? Well, are you going home or leaving? And I don't ever want to have that conversation. But one time, I was in a hurry, and I was flying by myself. And I got stuck in the middle seat. Oh, yeah, thank you for your compassion. Yeah, it's the worst, right? You're just, oh, no. And I reached in my backpack, and I realized I had forgotten something at home. Because unlike my wife, I don't make lists to check them off. I just forgot. Oh, no. No headphones, which meant sitting next to two people that were big talkers. (laughs) So I decided to flip it the script, I'm usually I don't talk about my job or anything because it's like you tell people you're past and they get super weird. But I was like, fine, I'm giving all the hints, right? Pretending to fall asleep, looking straight forward, just giving one word answers. I don't want to talk to you. And they just would not let it go. So I was like, fine, you want John the Baptist? Here we go. They're like, so what do you do? I go, I'm a pastor. They're like, really? I'm like, oh yeah. You brought this on yourself. It's happening. All right? Now, what I did was I, I told them the gospel. I told them the story of what I believe. And right, they started asking me questions. And basically, it was more cynical, like disbelieving questions of like, wait, you really believe God created everything? Yeah. Like, you really think it was all perfect that we messed it up? Yep. And you really think all those miracle things really happened? Yeah. And then the dude was like, wait, are you serious? Now everybody else is starting to look at us, which is, this is why I bring headphones, okay? <laughs> and they're like, and then like a dude across the aisle goes, wait, so like the virgin birth, you're totally cool with that. I'm like, yeah, it's Christmas, right? And we just proceeded, and basically every reaction to the story of Jesus was this almost like, you know, like when people kind of ask mocking style questions, like just like, you're ridiculous that you believe these things. And we just walk through it, yeah. So here's my point. When people hear the stories, there's this perfect God who the Bible describes is, is love. And he lives in perfect relationship in the Trinity. And he loves us perfectly in Jesus. And we tell them the stories of the birth of Jesus, the life, the death, and then the resurrection of Jesus, the whole hope of the goodness, which is good will conquer evil through Jesus Christ, that there is a perfect love for you that will never fail you, that you will never have to be parted from all these wonderful things, people will mock you. They will ask disbelieving questions. But on the inside, there is a longing in every human heart for that story, which is why all the stories of fantasy like Star Wars and Lord of the Rings and other things always keep getting made, and guess what people do? read them and watch them and fall in love with them. Why? Because they're telling us the stories that we ultimately long for, which is there is good conquering evil. There is the healing of all things. There is the healing of sadness. There is true love, right? And guess what we're going to keep doing as a society? We're going to keep writing books and keep making movies. 
And here's the point. There is the ultimate story behind all those stories, where it's not just fantasy anymore. It's not just a myth anymore, but it's the reality of how the world works. And so in verse 11 of Acts 14, we see this play out. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices and shouted, the gods have come down to us in human form. Now, do they get it wrong? Yeah, because they have Zeus and Hermes as their gods and other gods. But what is the longing for their hearts? That the gods would actually come down here to do something about the mess. And that's why they run to Paul and Barnabas, because what did Paul just do? He healed part of the mess. And through that, they thought, the gods are finally here to make all things right. And the good news that you and I have to share with the world is, it's not just a myth, it's not just a legend, it's not just a nice story. We get to share the good news. This is the true reality. This is the things that really happened. God really did come down in human likeness to fix the mess, to heal all the things that are broken and aching in our hearts to make all things new, to have good conquer over evil, and to give us a perfect love. So if you forgot everything I just said, which will not hurt my feelings, but there will be a quiz next week, here's the main thing I want you to remember. Here's how you share the good news of Jesus with a world that doesn't know the Bible. You just keep sharing the good news of Jesus because it's the story and it's the reality that every heart, whether they believe in God or not, is longing for. It is the one true story of good conquering evil, of perfect love that never fails us, of life conquering death, and that God's coming down to fix all the mess and heal all things. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give thanks that you are the true God who came down in human likeness to fix the mess, to heal all things, to conquer death, and to give us eternal life and perfect love. May we know and believe in that true gospel each and every day of our lives. And Holy Spirit, may you embolden us and give us the words that we need in order to share that true story of the goodness and love of Jesus with the world around us. In your name we pray. Amen.